let's get to the reason we're all here tonight. Melissa Perry. I'm really excited to host Melissa tonight. She's the CEO of Products Labs. She's a senior lecturer in product management course at Harvard Business School. She wrote this great book, Escaping the Build Shop. Again, her Twitter handle is Lissy Jean. If you want to, you know, tweet anything she shares or any screenshots. And I'm excited to hear from her today, her advice on the product of you, how to grow your product career. Thanks again, Melissa, for all that great, um, great advice that you shared. I do have some follow-up questions from, from your talk. Um, the first thing, and I love all the topics you covered, you talked about how there's strategy at the high level and there's tactics at the detailed level. And oftentimes they're not connected in companies, right? It's like teams are doing their two week sprints and they're in JIRA and then the board, the executive level is saying we're doing the strategy. And it just, it reminds me of like the underpant gnome from uh, South Park, right? Like it's step one, step two, step three. Uh, there's no step two that connects step one and two. So I'm just curious on that point, what advice do you have for product people, you know, that, so they can do a better job trying to connect the strategy with the tactics? Yeah, um, a big piece. So I, I always say that you can start right now trying to do this yourself. And sometimes I think as product managers, we have like the tendency to go, oh, all of this is wrong. I'm just going to like yell that nobody's doing it correctly at the strategy level. But like, but then you feel paralyzed because you're like, I don't control that, but I want to do things right. It's a weird feeling. It's, and it's, a, it's a hard feeling, right? I'll say more often than not, a lot of those answers to those strategy pieces exist somewhere. And it's about pulling it out of somebody's head. So I think the most impactful thing that you can do is go to your leaders and be like, Hey, I'm building this thing right now. And like, don't be like, this is wrong. You may even think it's wrong, but it's fine. It's like, don't, don't go crazy. Don't tell everybody it's wrong and that you shouldn't be doing it. Go, when I release this, what do you think is going to happen? Right? Like what, what's going to happen and write it down. Be like, what's going to change for our customers? Who's it impacting? What metrics can we measure when we go back? Try to gather that all that information because now you've got your success metric. You've got your outcome. And then you go, why? Okay. So why are we trying to do that? Like what, you know, why are we trying to increase customer engagement? And that could lead you to that product initiative piece. Right. And then if you ask why in that part, that could lead you to strategic intent. Um, and also ask people, I like to ask questions too that are like, so would you rather us like increase engagement or would you rather us like fix retention? Which one is more important, right? And now you can start to get the priorities of people out of their head. So it's a really simple way to just like clarify <laughs> some things. And sometimes people haven't thought about it or they have, and they just did not communicate it. And more often than not, right. people are thinking about that every day. They just don't communicate it. Um, so you can pull it out, you can write it down and you can be like, cool, can I, can I circulate this? Or maybe we should have like a little presentation on it. And usually that's, people are very receptive to that. So if you don't know what those answers are, go and ask, and then you could start to tell your story about what you were building back into those strategies. So now you can start to connect the dots, but just, just ask questions. And more often than not, the, the product leaders are like super happy you're doing that. They're going, oh, I didn't realize I didn't clarify that enough. Because they may have done like a presentation once and then forgot about it and you didn't quite get it, but they've been thinking about it every day. So they don't realize that you don't get it. And then when you bring up the questions, they go, oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Like, let's talk about that. Oh, did I not do a good job doing that? Let me go back and fix it. And they're just happy to hear that feedback. Yeah, I think that's good advice. And I think why is a very important question to ask. And I think a lot of times, especially outside the product world, stakeholders, they'll say, we need X, like build us X. And often it's a solution. And so they've, they maybe they like, to your point, maybe they haven't articulated or thought about explicitly the why, but by you. So it's almost like you have to do a little discovery with the stakeholders and be like, so yeah. what were you hoping to, like you said, what were you hoping to accomplish? And, and you don't need to do it in a challenging way. You're just like, so, so we can build this, you know, so we can build this effectively. What were you hoping to accomplish? Right. So, yeah. and, that, and I think your point's about setting up success criteria before you launch are really important because the human brain is great at revisionist history after the fact. So, you know, yeah, that was good. 2% conversion. Sure. You know, so cool. All right. And then related to that, you know, you said you talked uh, a fair bit about finance and how CPOs need to understand finance. And as you, you know, as you pointed out, a lot of product people, just the way they were trained or the way they come up, they didn't necessarily learn those skills. So I'm curious, 
for those people that say, yeah, that sounds good. I want to learn more about it. What advice would you have for CPOs to, to build or, you know, any product managers in general to build their finance skills? Yeah. A couple of things are important here. It's like one, understand who owns your company and how that changes what good outcomes look like. VCs are very different than private equity firms, very different than a public company. So if you know how the ultimate owners are and structured, that will give you some clues into how you're going to be prioritizing and why you're making certain decisions. Sorry, my dog's going crazy. Um, okay. The, uh, After all the cat pictures, you have a dog, Melissa. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't have a cat. Actually, now that I moved to South Carolina, <laughs> good segue, I have like a dozen <laughs> feral cats that live in my backyard and just like nice. eat all the snakes, which is great because now I don't have copperheads. Yeah. But it's like <laughs> nice. a million cats outside. And I was like, they found me. <laughs> oh my, I've seen your talks with all the cool cat gifts. I just like, oh, she I must know. be a cat lover. She must have a cat. That's hilarious. I love cats, um, but my like, my my sister and my dad are like wildly allergic and my best friend um, mm-hmm. to cats. So I can't have a cat instead. I have a hypoallergenic I dog. Got it. Smaller than a okay. cat. Okay. Um, nice. So, so uh, I forgot what we were talking about. The finance. How, how can PMs, you know, finance, once okay. they get over cool. cats versus dogs, how can they, how can they, you know, learn finance? It's the revenue and cost analogy. Um, no. So the, uh, yes. so once you understand the ownership structure there, it can give you a lot of insights. Like, VCs, for instance, value your companies usually if it's in a high growth mode on multiples of revenue. So they actually don't care about costs that much because they're hoping to sell that thing one day to somebody else. Um, right. Only when you get out of high growth phase, they're going to be like looking at your EBITDA and that's where like costs will come in. But that's something to know. So a lot of times you'll be sitting there going, why did my product leader not let us like fix a bunch of this tech debt over here that's like costing us money? And it's because of that. They're hoping to sell the company to somebody else who will have to fix it. (laughs) So it's just not on their priorities. Private equity firms are more cost conscious. They're looking at EBITDA. So they're going to be really fixing things and like streamlining it. They also don't get as big of a, you know, a payout usually when they sell the company is more about optimizing. And then um, IPOs are, you know, public companies, I mean, are like on a completely different level. So those are all about shareholder value and all the factors that go into that. So it's good to understand how your shares are being priced. So which does have to do with profits and stuff like that. Um, They're also heavily regulated and compliant. So you do have to follow a bunch of rules there. So I think with like understanding that type of stuff is important and how things get valued is really important. Um, And then looking at stuff like, can you read a balance sheet? If you don't know how to read a balance sheet, go learn how to read a balance sheet. Um, Understand how, uh, you know, one way to do this too is like, go talk to the CFO at your company or finance person at your company. They're going to tell you how these things Mm. run, but ask them like, um, how do you do the budgeting, right? What what factors go in there? Like, how do you you think through that? Why do we have to hit it down? Um, Understanding to how... um, product gets CapEx and OpEx, like where those things fall over. Working with finance to understand that stuff, that's really important. Um, Understanding, you know, I said balance sheet, but then also profits and loss statements are really important to read. Uh, Big ones too, I think that we don't pay attention to enough, but like I've seen this come down to tons of product strategy development. Understanding like SAM versus TAM versus SOM, huge. Uh, also, I see a lot of executives not understand that or and some VCs sometimes too. Um, but they're like, the TAM is huge. And you're like, cool, uh, we can get this much of the pie within the next you know, three years because of contracts and what we have and who we're like serving right. and all that stuff. So all those things really go into um, understanding the product too. So I, I think it's really like a lot of CFOs are so excited that you actually care about finance that they're very happy to talk to you about right. this stuff. Same with finance people. Um, but uh, also Gift Constable, who I mentioned in there, has written several blog posts about um, what fi- uh, what product CPOs need to know about finance, which I think is a great place to start too. Cool. But Melissa, the TAM is so big. We only need 1% of the market. The TAM yeah. is so big. Just 1%. <laughs> but, yeah. So you threw out a few terms there, TAM, SAM, CapEx, OpEx. And I think that like, so operating expense, capitalized expense. So, you know, that's, I think part of it is like, I, you know, I think I haven't seen gifts articles, but just like, and I do think talking to finance is awesome, but uh, I also believe in people like taking their learning into their little hands. So maybe there are some yeah. like free courses out there, like finance yeah. 101, corporate finance 101, 
accounting 101. It's a little boring, but when you get to the point of being able to read a PL statement, it's, it's pretty cool. So, uh, and I think one thing that's helpful, like you probably have done this too, Melissa, is when you're advising startups is mm-hmm. just being able to create a simple Excel model of like users, you know, you know, how many new users are we getting per month and how many are we losing and what's the revenue per month? And then you can kind of build yeah. a little model that, that, you know. Yes. So that becomes critical. That's a really good point. We did a little webinar for CPO Accelerator on it with um, GIF the other day, but modeling is incredibly important now. And it's it's a lot of assumptions. So you're trying to base the assumptions on as totally. much fact as you can get or as close to as possible. But you really, if you don't know how to do modeling, um, it's a great thing to actually get into. So we're basically building like extremely large <laughs> spreadsheets. <laughs> Lovely. Um, but we're working with, right. uh, you know, we're working with sales and we're saying like, hey, what's our conversion rate on these types of co- customers right now? If we added another salesperson, what could it possibly be? Can we take on the enterprise? We're pulling all that data into our spreadsheets. Then we're going to finance and asking them about certain stuff. We're going to the product team, and the tech team, and we're taking in their, you know, their estimates and putting it in there. But we're modeling all this stuff out to start to project when we could start booking revenue based on the types of products, the product strategy that we have. So how much is this going to cost? How much revenue could we potentially get? That helps you communicate up to the board as well. Right. And, you know, that kind of now we just said, so you basically need to be good at Excel or Google Sheets now. It's like not only do you need to know finance, you'll be able to do that stuff. So, but it, I would just say it's it's eminently learnable. A lot of PMs learn it. It's not like you need to get a PhD yeah. in it. You just need to go study it a little bit. There's a lot of books out there like Finance for Entrepreneurs, you know, Accounting for Entrepreneurs that are really practical that you could check out. Yeah. Um, related to that, I'm going to jump in. Somebody asked this question is like, do you think an MBA is important for CPO? So when you talk about business finance skills, this question sometimes comes up. So what do you think, Melissa? I think it helps. I don't think it's necessary. Even though I teach the MBA class, I do not have an MBA. <laughs> I love amazing. the irony. I love the irony. I'm the, it's awesome. I'm the odd duck. They learn some really cool stuff though. So I go and read yeah. some of their cases. I'm like, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but I think like, I, I don't think an MBA can hurt by any means. Um yeah. Uh, especially when you're trying to learn some higher level business schools, uh, business skills. So I think like what I've seen from a lot of my students is they're really well positioned at, you know, taking the leap into the executive piece, but they just don't have the product skills. So a lot of them need to go right. be product managers first, but they will be well primed yeah. to become an executive. Yeah. So I have an MBA and what I've found, and I think this measures the most, it's like the farther you move up, that's the more it becomes useful. Like when you're a tactical PM, you know, it's tactical PM. You didn't learn anything probably unless they took your course about, you know, tactical PM. Uh, but then later when you get more senior, you understand accounting and marketing and HR and stuff. It, it's a little beneficial, but I agree with you the same way, even though I have an MBA, I would never say you have to have one to be a PM. I think it, it's one way to, to gain these, these finance skills. The other thing though, is it's also a two-year commitment. It's like, you're out of the job market for two years. And frankly, learning a lot of stuff that may not be relevant to your tech PM career, which is why a lot of business schools have actually, not a lot, several have said, you know what, we're going to do a one-year tech MBA where we just teach you what you need to know for tech. So it kind of changes the, the pros and cons of that equation. So, all right, cool. Step. Okay. You next, you brought up product operations. I know that's grown a lot recently. I'm just curious, why do you think it's grown so much in the last few years? I think because the organizations got more standardized from product management. Like we've been scaling organizations and people realized like, uh, we need to enable these teams a little bit better. Also, I feel like a lot of stuff was done extremely manually before and it was just a lot of overhead. But as we got more software and more systems in place, um, which definitely helped, it's like, how do we choose the right one? How do we find the right fit for this? Um, And that's always fallen on somebody. I think we're just now standardizing, like that's actually a role. That's something that we need. That's like this whole group. So I think product operations has been like done in some capacity at many companies that are scaling. It's just a matter of like, what did we call that person before? And a lot of it too is being done um, as we were scaling off the sides of desks of like product managers. And I'm like, if you are, uh, I got into this like debate with Marty, but like, I saw I, on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we talked about it in person too, but like, um, I am on the firm belief of like, if you are a product manager, like that's what you should be concentrating on. Also product managers aren't cheap. 
these days. Like I would, if I'm hiring sure. a product manager, I would like them to be working on product, right. not teaching themselves MongoDB like I was to get the data out of the friggin' database mm-hmm. so that I could mm-hmm. do the analysis I needed and like set success metrics. So that's where right. I think, you know, product operations becomes important because if somebody's only doing this off the side of their desk, it's never going to get done. Right. Usually if it's affecting like one product manager, it's affecting a bunch of product managers. So sure. Sure. also I think as we get into, it becomes really important, I think in growth stage, right? Because we have yes. to make decisions yes. more rapidly. And if you have to take 40 hours to go get the data out of the systems to be able to make that decisions, you can't keep up with the pace that you need. Yeah, I think those are great points. A couple of points I would add is probably the best parallel was, it's funny because everybody's getting blank ops now, but the first one was kind of sales ops, right? Sales, you had a sales Mm -hmm. team and they decided, you know, we need a sales app team to make them more efficient. Like let's have them selling. They're doing stuff on the side of their desk. So nobody really kind of, that was a logical thing. Everybody's, yeah, I get it. We're helping, you know, one of my good friends worked in sales ops and he's like a force multiplier for sales. So that general idea makes sense because I think that several years ago, before product ops was a thing, what would happen is either no one on the team would step up and do it and be like, hey, what, yeah, what road mapping tool should we use? What process should we use? How do we get the data out of the tool? In my experience on good product teams, one of the more rock star product people would just step up and do it on the side. Like you said, hey, I went out and researched, here's the thing I think we should use, right? So it was a side, a collateral duty and that's part of the problem with PM is we often have many things that are collateral duties. If, if we don't have enough QA, we're doing the QA. If we don't have a designer, we're doing the wireframes. If sales needs help, we're in the, so, so I hear you um, that it makes sense to kind of take it off the plate of product that's, people so they can be more effective. And that's hard too, because like, if you're doing so many things, that's not your job too, you're going to burn out one day or you're not going to like totally. it and you're going to leave. And a lot of product managers leave because they go, oh, I didn't get to do product management. Right. Yeah, totally. And it's interesting because it, I, not to oversimplify it, but it often just comes down to the ratio of PMs to engineers. If mm-hmm. you've got 20 engineers for one PM, they're going to have their plate. They're going to be like an inch thin and a mile wide, and they're going to burn out to your point. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So related to that, there's been some discussion online about, Hey, what's the best background for people to get into product ops? Um, just curious what your thoughts are on that. I, I have like, Differing opinions for different pieces. So it depends what you start. So let's start with like, where do you start with product ops? Um, I think growth stage companies need to start with the data piece, um, mostly because they have to make rapid decisions really fast. So if you can't make those decisions as a chief product officer, it's really hard to be effective. In that case, um, when I was consulting, we used to have a couple of product ops analysts on my team who were amazing. And uh, they came from a background of consulting. So they were two Mm. years out of, you know, in McKinsey and out. They want to be product managers, but they were great at the modeling that we just talked about. Mm -hmm. They really understand the dynamics of the business. Um, We had to teach them how product management worked, but they were fantastic at data modeling and could pull it out and put it into things that executives understood and could make decisions off of. So that I think is really important um, skill to have in your team um, somewhere. The uh, other one is if you're going to start with streamlining research, like let's say you can't get in touch with your users or you have the problem I described right. before. Um, we had like a, I guess, uh, so I've also seen, uh, where, what do you call it? Design ops do some of this too, where they, or research ops, right? Everybody research knows. ops, totally. It's the best. Ops, it's the yes. best, yes. yes. Build, build the database and that's totally fine. I'm like, if they're doing it, great. Uh, they did do it at, um, at, which call it uh, Athena Health, which I was talking about, but they fell under the CPO, but they right. uh, had a research ops team that built that out and they were great. If you have them, use them. If you don't have them, like get somebody in to start that. Right. And right. then lastly is the pra- uh, the processes. And this is where I think Marty starts ranting about process people, but yes. it's because I don't have a problem with somebody starting with roadmaps because like I said in my talk, like if you come in as a CPO, and I, I've been in this situation where people give you 18 different roadmaps and you have absolutely no idea how to reconcile them and you have no idea like what level people are working on and it's really not detailed or it's not the right stuff, how do you make decisions off of that? So where I see larger companies start with is actually standardizing the roadmap, teaching people how to get to the right level of a roadmap, putting it into something where they can actually look at um, 
And that's what <laughs> Marty doesn't like. But the thing is, you have to move on from roadmaps eventually. You don't optimize them to death. And then you go on to the next process and the next pieces for whatever is a stopgap there. But I see a lot of large companies do that because they don't know what people are working on, which is a really right. valid question to answer. So I don't yeah. have a problem with people starting with processes as long as they know that the the point of the process is to optimize it so that everybody can see it and read it and get the information they want and then move on. Yeah. I would just add a point on research ops. This was even before product ops was even a word or a thing. Yeah. I was consulting to a company and we had to do a lot of customer research. And, you know, like if you don't have a design team, who's going to go out and again, who's going to go out and find the customers. It's going to fall on the PM, like the PM yeah. PMs, PM, PMs fill gaps in their teams when they need to. So then the design team, they hired some junior person because all they had to do is schedule. They had to go talk to the people and schedule the appointment. It's not a complicated job. To your point, it's not the best use of a high paid PM's time, not the best use of a high paid UX designer or researcher's time. They just hired someone, you know, right out of school and they just lined up, you know, they lined up the people and they made sure they met the criteria and that was it. So I've seen that kind of, it's not even necessarily even a full-time job, like a part-time research associate can help really take a lot off people's plates in that space. Yeah. I don't know. So, so that's cool. Yeah. And then, um, yeah. And so then, and it makes sense. It's great. The different pieces of you starting with data to have someone who has an analytics or consulting background. Mm -hmm. The other question that came up, there was a debate on LinkedIn that I saw the other day recently about do product ops people need to have work experience in product management or not? So mm -hmm. I'm curious what your opinion is there. My data analyst didn't. And right. but you do have to know that if you have somebody who hasn't, you do have to train them. So like we we did, that was a choice that we made, right? We said we will train them in product management, teach them, teach them that, but we really need those skills. Um, so they brought a lot of skills to the table and they picked it up very, very quickly. Like it didn't, it didn't need like a ton of hand holding for what they were doing. If you're doing the process piece though, that person probably needs good experience in product management because otherwise you won't know yeah. all the things yeah. there. Um so I do think it depends on what you're hiring for. Um, but also you should probably look at your team and say, do we have the capacity to train somebody or do we not? Right. I totally agree with you. That's the beauty of how you laid it out. To me, it's very clear. If you're the process person recommending how to do roadmaps, you probably oh, yeah. should have a product management background. But if you're yeah. more of an analytics consulting person, then that makes perfect sense. They can grow into that. So that's cool. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. And then the other thing, one of the other things I like from your talk is the statement, hey, my executives just don't get it, right? And I've seen people say that, PM say that about not just executives, but hey, engineering doesn't get it. Sales doesn't get it. Marketing, like they, whoever they, the other functional group is, they don't get it. And I like your point of view, which is like, hey, like it's it's not us versus them. You know, so I'm just curious, what advice if if what advice do you have for product people on how to collaborate more effectively with stakeholders and other functions if they feel that way? Yeah. I mean. Sometimes what I see usually fail there is people are kind of like us as the product managers are kind of yelling at <laughs> the um, other teams in like the language that we use and trying to get them to understand it, right? Instead of bringing in the language that they use and why it's going to be important for them. So it comes down to like, uh, I, I had this written into um, a Dear Melissa episode on my podcast the other day where they said, I go and I try to explain to them why we need to do discovery and I explain to them how we do discovery. And I, I try to tell them why it's important, but they just don't get it. They don't want us to do discovery. I don't think it's that those people, and they're talking about like sales and other stakeholders mm -hmm. um, because they're like, they just want features to ship. I'm like, of course they want features to ship. If they're sales and they can't sell anything, they don't get money because they're paid on commission, right? So how do you reframe it in a way where we're taking out like, hey, we need to do this process because it's a product thing. Instead, make it, hey, we need, uh, I want to ship the thing over here for you to go make money. Um, let's make sure we're shipping the right thing because if I put the wrong thing out there, you won't be able to sell it. So let's get down and talk about our assumptions and like what's around here and what we need to, to really figure out before we build this thing or before we ship it. So like, let's get together, tell me what you know, I'll tell you what I know, and then we'll we'll walk through it, right? And sometimes it's about like stripping out all of the lingo that we use and just getting back down to, okay, what are you trying to accomplish? And let me tell you like how we're gonna help you accomplish that, but this is what we need to do to do it. 
and just really going back down to the outcomes and focusing on it and then listening to that person. That's what I see bring people around more and also ask them like, why? You know, like, like, okay, I know this is the goal you're trying to get to. Why? Tell me, like, is there a deadline coming up that I don't know about? And that's why you're freaking out. Do we have like a, you know, a marketing fair or a big push that I don't know about? These types of things I think come up in these conversations and we don't take the time to sit down with people and really like uncover what's the underlying stuff there. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah, cool. Um, And then one other thing actually related to the research ops piece was, you know, as you were talking about the skills that that CPOs need, you know, oftentimes these days, UX often reports into the CPO or VP of product designers, researchers, if you're lucky to have them. So I'm just curious how important you think it is for CPOs to have UX skills or strong UX awareness. How do you think about that? I'm partial. <laughs> and I'm going to say that they need to have strong UX skills. Um, okay. I was a, a hybrid UX product manager for a long time. So, um, but I will say that if you do, like, I think if you build some kind of product where workflows are critical and a lot of the value is placed in the UX, you really need to understand UX, right? And um, I think people come to product from different ways of evaluating it. I was talking to my friend about this once, like she approaches, um, she's like a CPO too, but she like, uh, she approaches figuring out what companies are doing more from a financial perspective and breaking down all the finance and where the money's going. I approach understanding products by looking at the product and understanding how people use the workflow. So I want to watch people use things. And that's like, to me, that's where I start to understand the value of it. And then I trace it back to the financials, but like, that's, that's what I need to understand first. So I've seen a lot of CPOs who are not super UX focused. Um, they get by, by I think hiring a super strong head of design that reports into them and partnering with them and listening to them. And I think if you form that relationship, you'll learn more, um, but you should really take it upon yourself as a CPO too, to get better at understanding UX and where the flaws are. Like for me, I used to do a lot of like, um, what do you call it? Uh, what's the word when you evaluate the company for investment? Due diligence. Due diligence. There we go. Um, so I was doing due diligence for some VCs and, uh, I look at the UX a lot just to see like, how bad is it? Like, is it, it's actually solving a problem. A lot of times it's bad, but is it actually solving a problem? Is it good? Is it in there? Because that's going to need a lot of work. And I saw so many people skipping over it because they were just looking at more of the numbers and the customer pieces. So like, for me, that was really telling me like what we were going to have to overhaul or what we're going to have to fix. And I'll say like, the majority of problems I've ever worked on in product have come down to UX problems because they've been poorly designed. Um, And once you unlock that, the company goes crazy. But uh, I, so I do think it's a very critical skill there, Uh, but I'm partial. So I do think you need to have a good understanding of UX. Even if you've never been a UX designer, totally fine. But like, you really need to understand why UX is important. Um, It's going to be different if you're working on like super backend AI focused, you know, stuff. Sure, you don't need to be as UX. Maybe you need to be a lot more technical, but it's going to spike depending on the products there. Yeah, I feel it's funny because it's in a way it's a little parallel to finance. Like you need to, it's not your main job, but you need to learn it to be more effective. So ultimate cage match, should you invest in finance or UX, Melissa? The cage, finance or UX? Ooh, I'd say UX. Which is more important. I would too, I would too. I go UX first. It wasn't in your, it wasn't in your, I didn't see it. Maybe I missed that. I didn't see it in your slides. That's why I wanted to No, I think I I'm, assume, I'm just... I think I assume people like product ah, people know no. UX, which is bad. So mm-hmm. I will, I will, I will no. edit that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's funny. Just a quick thing. Like when I started my first PM job at Intuit, you know, I, I walked into a machine, a PM machine and then fought, and like they would write a PRD. These old days of those 60 page PRDs that nobody read. And I'm like, I'm going to write even better PRD. I'm going to be more detailed. I'm going to address more corner cases, do more research. And I finished the PRD and we started the cycle. I'm like, oh man, like if this PRD is amazing, it, this could be a perfect MRD. But if like the PRD, if the UX design sucks, this, none of this matters, yeah. you know? So I do think it's also something where, um, you, again, you don't need to be a designer, but there's a lot of books and blogs and courses you can take to build up aware, what I call awareness or skill, you know, without yeah. doing it. So it's, it's one thing to be able to critique a design. It's another to be like, hey, design this for me. And no one's saying you need to be a designer, but I think being able to critique designs. 
and have better conversations with designers is better. So I agree. Cool. Okay. Last question before we switch to audience Q&A, it's kind of a timely question. You know, we're seeing all these layoffs in the tech industry and I'm sure a lot of PMs are out there wondering, hey, how is this impacting the PM job market? So I'm just curious, what are you seeing from where you sit as far as how, I know it changes by week, but just what's your latest take on what's going on with the PM job market? I think a lot of the tech companies that were laying off got too big. Um, you pro- if A lot of the stuff they were doing was probably not prioritized, not what they should be focusing on. So it was inevitable that it was going to happen. It's just sad that it all happened at once. Uh, but I do think it opened up a lot of opportunities for smaller companies to attract PM talent. It has been incredibly hard for growth stage companies, startups to attract talent because uh, Facebook's been coming in and dropping 400 grand on a new PM, which is nuts. Like that is insane that it got inflated that way. But like my MBA students, the packages are getting, I'm like, What? This was not like that when I graduated from school. Like it's insane. And the growth stage companies can compete. So that's why you walk into a growth stage company and you're like, why do you have 10 junior PMs who've never done this before? And nobody here who knows what they're doing. It's because it couldn't compete. They couldn't compete with it. And I, and I get that. But so I think from a, from a salary standpoint, you're probably not going to be making as much as like what Google and Facebook was was paying everybody. Um, and I do think some of the salaries are going to drop or let's say stabilize because I think they got inflated. Uh, but I do think anybody who did get laid off has a really golden opportunity to go work for a high growth company right now because they're still hiring. I know tons and tons of tech companies that are still hiring um, that are smaller, that are not these big enterprises because they've been looking for help for so long and they, they've they got to move quickly. And right now in this market too, if they don't move quickly, they will fall under. So they're looking for all the help they can get. So I do think there's really golden opportunities for that. I think if you have good experience, it's a lot of, you know, it's a good, it's a good time to try to move into a director role at like a growth stage company. If you've got some great experience and you can show that you can move fast and you worked at good projects um, at bigger companies, like you can leverage that and go. But um, I think a lot of those things, <laughs> good list of high growth companies look at. What I do is I go to, I just saw this too, go to like a VC's website and look at their portfolio companies. So find a VC that invests in high growth, like Insight Partners was one that I worked with. They use only high growth SaaS companies. If you go to their portfolios, you can see all the um, companies that they're currently invested in and you click in and see who's hiring. Great. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point that I definitely saw startups struggling to compete with the big companies that could just seems like a bottomless pit of money. <laughs> yeah, and, and so they would satisfy, they would hire who they could, right? Because you have to, you can't sit there for, you know, it's kind of like, it reminds me of finding a good apartment in the Bay Area. Like you can't wait forever. You, otherwise you'll never get a place to live. So you have to like, you know, make it, make trade-offs. And so that's a good point. Um, I think that's a good point. And then the other thing about tech industry, I've always felt is true is, even if the tide is going down for a lot of people, there's always someone who just raised their B round yeah. or their C round. There's somebody that's growing and has money. So I do think it's a, an exciting time for, for talented PMs to, to maybe make some moves. So, all right, cool. Thank you so much, Melissa. With that, let's, we have a lot of questions now that have piled up. So let's switch over mm-hmm. to audience Q and a first up, we have Christopher Homan. Thank you again for the, the presentation. That was great. Um, quick question for you. I liked your scorecard. I'm kind of curious, like if you if you think you have some gaps in the scorecard. Let's say I'm I'm currently a you know a, a VP in a in a startup, but I'd like to work more at a, at a growth company, and mm-hmm. I haven't had the chance to work under a great you know CPO at a growth company, but would would love the opportunity. But I mean, how would you sort of bridge that gap? Would you go out and seek activities outside your current role? What would you recommend to try to get that experience? I think you can develop some of it. So if you've been in a startup and you want to go grow stage, um, if you come in as like an individual contributor, uh, I think that transition is usually pretty easy. Are you, are you thinking about coming in as a leader or are you coming in as, as a, a Yeah, either. I mean, ideally it would be nice that it'd be at the, you know, it's either the CPO role or just under. Yeah. Um, I, I, I've been a part of growth uh, and led growth at large organizations. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I've spent a lot go. of time in startups more recently. But okay. Um, anyway, go ahead. That's it. Like, okay. So one, one of the things, um, that we do do, which is, which is really worth mentioning. So thanks for bringing this up 
is yeah. if you can show that you've led growth in a large organization, but you had that that experience on that product as part of the organization, that's yeah. fine. Like we hired somebody in um, to a growth stage company as CPO uh, from Square, and he had led and like Square is huge, right? Mm -hmm. So it was not. Square as a profile, not what we're looking for, but he had led one of these products that was in high growth stage at Square, oversaw the whole product strategy, oversaw a team that was slightly larger than the one that they had. So like his story at that enterprise matched very nicely to what the company was going through and the domain was pretty close to what it was too. So that that is great. So what you need to do is on your resume, if you have um, those that enterprise, put what you did, like led a high growth initiative from, you know, tens of millions of dollars a year to hundreds or whatever it was, right? Like, yeah. like in 400 X did in, you know, three years, whatever you want to put in there, but like tell the yeah. growth story in the bullets, because that will show up on the radar. And that's like the story that you tell is like, I have done growth within a large enterprise. I want to come to a place where it's a little more unrestricted. I went to startups to get out of, you know, to learn more about the the smaller companies and how they work. And now I want to bridge that gap, but now you've got two, two bookends. And I think that does actually set you up pretty, pretty well for the growth. I'd say it might be hard to get the CPO role immediately, but you mm -hmm. could probably get a VP role at like a, a slightly larger, like a VP of product role, a slightly larger growth thing. Look at yeah. what you don't like, which, what skills you don't have, and then make that jump pretty easily next time. Gotcha. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, Christopher, thanks for your question. Next up, we have Andrew Slomka. Thank you. Hey, Melissa. Uh, you covered responsibilities around the product portfolio, managing the product and product operations. How important is people development slash coaching skills in more senior roles? And how do those responsibilities change between uh, like senior PM slash director of product all the way up to CPO? Yeah, that's a good question. So... Um... Typically, your senior PMs and your directors of PMs are going to do most of the coaching. Now, if you have a VP with no directors below it, you are responsible for the coaching of your product managers. And that is that is important. As a chief product officer, you ideally need to hire somebody in to do most of that coaching. And you want to develop the leaders. So that's how you should think about it. Is like you're going to hire in either directors or if you do a budget, the VPs. Um, Ideally, it's VPs reporting into you and they're the functional leaders and you're developing them as leaders. You're still hanging out with your team. You're still like lending, you know, an ear to them, but you're not doing the day-to-day -day coaching. So you need to push that down because otherwise you won't have as much time as a CPO to concentrate some on some other stuff. So a huge part of director's jobs are to coach the teams and to steer the teams and level them up. Um, I think senior PMs can help demonstrate that they have the capabilities of a director by doing some of that too, even though it might not be in your job description, but um, going out of your way and just being a mentor to them and coaching them, that usually sets you up nicely to make that leap and show that you could do that. Um, and then VPs of product, if you have directors, you're usually going to be coaching the directors, but you might be doing things like thinking about training or setting stuff up at scale for people to learn. But if you don't have directors, then you're usually going to be responsible for coaching the product managers too. Got it. Thank you. Great. Thanks for your question, Andrew. And you know what it makes me think about, Melissa? It makes me think about, um, we didn't get into this detail, but like, are you managing one level of PMs or are you managing two levels of PMs, right? And kind of to your point, like if you're managing two levels of PMs, then, then maybe those are the people that, you know, train the next level down or coach the next level down, right? Yeah, exactly. So it's kind of like, I see it as if you're a CPO, you're usually developing the VPs that report into you and you could have right. a VP of product, a VP of UX, like let's say ideal world, you have VP of product, a VP of UX, VP of product operations. If you're big enough, like with 5,000 people right. at Athena Health, we needed that smaller companies, you might not need a VP right. level, um, right. but it could be a director of operations. Uh, Sometimes there's like, uh, there, there's other roles that, you know, maybe content sometimes is underneath you or things mm -hmm. like that. Yep. So you're developing those leaders as a CPO typically, and then they're developing the people underneath them, but you're hiring some senior right. people to get leverage there too. Right. And if you're starting at the other end, you may be like, 
a director, you may be like at the early stage start, you may be the solo director, maybe have one or two PMs and then you get yeah. promoted. Now you've got same thing. You've got multiple directors. And so you yep. need to kind of manage the PMs through them. So yeah, good. Like awesome. That. Cool. Okay. Next up we have David Holly. So Melissa, cool. when you were talking about the software native organizations, you segmented, <laughs> segmented them by startup growth and enterprise my all my domain is all corporate IT, that non-software native group. How would you segment those organizations? And the reason why I ask that is that if you have a bank that has one location or it's a regional, you know, a small regional yeah. bank with like five branches, I don't see them as having um you know, technically they might be a startup or a growth, but I don't see them as really having an IT department or having products. So in my mind, it's more that enterprise level that is already, a, you know, a billion or two billion in revenue getting into products. So how would you enterprise, how would you segment the enterprises for non um, native? When you mean segment, do you mean like, how would you set up the teams? More so in terms of, um, like I'm, I'm moving into product and yeah. just getting into that. And so the thought was, what should I be looking at in terms of where this organization is? Okay. Um, and I, I keep coming back to the idea of maturity. You know, yeah. is it a case where they don't have any product, you know, product gotcha. is something they're talking about versus something where they've, I'll say it, implemented safe for lack of a better yeah. <laughs> Okay. So, um, I'll tell you about like a couple of good ones, but I've worked with a lot of like banks who've, who've transitioned from it to, uh, to more product focus. Ideally what's going to happen is you're going to organize around your main product lines. And so like there's the credit card division, there is the retail banking division, there is the commercial banking division, right? Let's take those three, just for instance. Now in smaller banks, um, which I do think is actually good practice. They've thought about product two as different things like a platform that stretches across the bank and then having applications um, that sit on the platform, which holds all the data, right? So that you can be smart about going across these different businesses and then having applications sit on top of the data that has um, that has like a VP of product that manages the application piece that plugs into it. So you'd have a VP of product over the platform, VP of product of credit cards, VP of product of commercial banking, Usually there's a GM over those business lines too, who are thinking about more of the commercial aspects. The smaller it is, the less less levels there, the bigger it is. Like, let's talk about your 250,000 people banks, right? Like your, your JP Morgans of the world and stuff like that. Sometimes those divisions are so big that they have like platforms inside each one of those. And they they're actually, some companies are so big that they have a really hard time of thinking of how to do a platform across the whole company. So they're actually not leveraging as much stuff as it could be. They have a lot of data. They're just like making sense of it. So what they're doing versus what they could be doing is, is actually like a, a different thing, but let's take like a smaller bank. Um, what those banks to uh, also do is where you get into like a lot of, um, you know, angst, I guess, is now let's talk about like, financial product managers versus software product managers. So usually there's somebody who's like, I was the product managers for loans. And now you're the product manager over here for uh, under something that does with loans too. Like, how do we work together? So they end up be you want to end up thinking about your software. Like here are, what do we serve at the end of the day? All right. If the idea is to get somebody a loan, how do they do that? And then there's a product manager for software over the whole process of doing the loan. And then the financial people plug in at the right moments to determine whether or not those people get the loans and like work with the things. So you can still have finance product managers, subject matter experts who like plug in, but uh, the experience and the um, end-to-end application of the loan and delivering of the loan needs to be overseen by a software product manager so that they know how to manage it end-to-end. So that's typically where um, you see at least banks like get broken down that way. So when you're thinking of the strategy of like a loan, right? Or the loan products as a VP of product there, um, you're not usually just considering software. You're considering the the loan product of what we want to grow. So like the GM's kind of thinking through a lot of the growth strategies of the business, like a CEO would be. And you could think of the VP of product here, like a CPO job, right? 
thinking through uh, how do we accomplish that through software and how do we add to that through these different places. Does that make sense? Awesome. Thanks for your question. Okay, next up we have Sofia Saravia. Hi, Melissa. I'm a senior product manager at NASDAQ and I'm really excited to learn more about UX. And I was just wondering, you know, what recommendations you have for someone that's um, sort of early mid-career to, um, you know, dive deep into UX. Yeah. Um, one, if you have UX designers, you can go shadow and work with. That's always great to just learn from them and see what they're doing. But if you want to kind of dive a little bit deeper, um, fantastic books out there on UX. Uh, I got started with Don't Make Me Think by Steve Krug, which is like so basic, but breaks down really how you go through the different frameworks of using the internet and what's important there. I think that's a great one to really look at. Lean UX by Jeff Gothelf is really about how do we do UX and, and Josh Seiden. Um, don't want to forget Josh. Uh, I've heard Jeff and Josh, <laughs> both my friends. But uh, Josh is always like, I get left out all the time because Jeff's the first one on the book. Um, <laughs> but that's a really great way of like, how do we think through rapid, um, you know, rapid development of UX and going through um, good iterations to uh, explain it. You can also go through like, think through different facets of UX, right? Like there's user research, which is its own thing. Then there's like information architecture, which honestly, I've seen it just be a massive problem. But like, I would Google and dig into like, how do we do good information architecture? Then there's actually like user experience design, which is more about the wireframing of the whole, you know, the whole thing. Then there's user interface design, which is like getting into the nitty gritty of how we interact with the actual screen and how we lay those things out. Um, and then you've got graphic design on top of it that actually like makes it pretty. Uh, so there's a lot of different facets when it comes to design. And what I'd recommend is maybe breaking them, like start from a holistic perspective. And then as you get going with it, and that's a great book too that um, Dan just posted in there, like break down each facet of design and try to get like deeper into each one. And I think that will help. Now, if your goal is to become like, be able to critique UX design well. Um, other things that I would do is like, maybe watch other people's teardowns on why UX works. Watch people use products. I get very curious just like watching people use things. And then I critique everything that I use, which is awful because like the whole internet just bothers me then. So um, <laughs> so like watch people use, use stuff and ask them questions too, where it's like, Hey, why'd you get like stuck on that? So like, even like I'll watch my dad use something and I'll be like, where do you think that should be? Right? Like, where, where, what were you thinking when you went here? Um, which drives me nuts. But uh, it's, it's like tells you how people will think. And a lot of UX design is really getting on like, like understanding how people think and what they expect and then meeting their expectations. Like, I think that's half of UX design. Um, so helping people get to what they want to accomplish in a faster way. So I would start there. Um, definitely classes you can take on Product Institute. We have a UX design fundamentals class too that's available. Um, so if you wanted to go deeper, there's stuff like that. We do that specifically for PMs um, to learn UX design. So we put that out there. Um, but I would start maybe like start with a, a higher level book on UX design and then go like deeper and deeper. Very helpful. Thank you. All right, cool. I'm glad we touched on UX design because I think it's very important. So that's great. And yeah, I rec I in the chat, I recommend a few books. Sounds like you're familiar with the non-designer design book. It's great. It's not even meant for digital per se. It's just yeah. a good layout. You know, I remember I when I became a first became a consultant, I designed my business cards on my own. And then I read that book and I like, oh my gosh. And I read this my business card, they look like 10 times better. Not that they look great, yeah. but they look better just by following her simple principles. It does. And like, if you study what good looks like and why, I think that's really important too. Like when I got started with UX design, um, it was because I could Photoshop. So they were like, oh, cool. You could be like the product manager. Uh, UX designer. There you go. And I was more of a, a graphic designer. Not that I was like trained or anything, but I, right. I got by. And so that's how I got started with that. And I would do all the mock-ups in Photoshop for stuff. Um, but then I went to a startup and I did the mock-ups there and I started teaching myself a little bit more, a little bit more, but right. then we hired a director of UX who came in and originally I was like furious because I liked doing the UX and she was going to take it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But then she taught me all the things that she knew, which was fabulous. So I was like, right. Oh, cool. This is so much better than I've been doing. Yes. And so I like soaked that up. 
But yeah. um, a big thing that I started doing was just going to websites that people considered good or liked, or that was popular. And then looking at how they laid out things and why did that work for them? And, you know, breaking down other websites, I think is really critical. Yeah, no, and it's the same thing as, especially in startups, you're lucky to have a designer. So PM's yeah. going to be like, yeah, I made some wireframes or I know sketch or Figma now or Photoshop or Dreamweaver or whatever it is. Ah, I did some stuff. Mm -hmm. And then you get a, you know, a real trained designer in and you, they can up level it. So uh, a couple other books that I like elements of user experience by Jesse James Garrett. It's a high level book, but it gives you a good overview of the different elements of user experience. And then Leah Buley, uh, it did a typo on when I typed it, Leah Buley, B-U-L-E-Y. She's actually spoken to me. Her book is awesome. And her book is specifically like, if you're the sole designer to start up, but I think non-designer people can learn a lot from cool. her book too so yeah awesome cool awesome. all right yeah well the other thing this as far as tools go i'm a big fan of balsamic because yeah. sometimes those high-end tools like photoshop or figma are overkill for a pm to do but a wireframing tool like balsamic is like the right level to engage with even if you have a designer you can be like hey i did this lo-fi thing here take this and as input and do whatever yeah. you want just sketching too. Like I make all of my students exactly. at HBS sketch first. Totally. Boxes and lines. And then, then totally you can go agree. into your prototyping stuff. Totally agree. Yep. Awesome. Cool. All right. We've got a UX love fest. Next up, Micah Stroud. Thank you so much. Uh, Long-term uh, lurker, first time caller. Um, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I, one of, the, one of the challenges I have myself, and I think that other folks have based off of uh, other product managers and folks I've hired in the past is if you've done anything lateral in your career, and then you go back and look at your CV now, it's really hard to communicate to someone that you have a lot of the skills and a lot of the capabilities that uh, you're talking about. And uh, I know at least in, in my career, it's been very challenging because of those kind of lateral moves and things like that. How would you go about kind of overcoming that? Because I know when I talk to, I'm definitely in the market right now, but when I talk to hiring managers, like, like the automated system looks at your title, will never, yeah. never even offer you these roles. Ooh, yeah, the automated systems are hard. Um, I blew up personally my own resume. It, it's not like a linear resume at all. And I do recommend that to people. The automated systems do make it a little harder, but I think if you can hit it, so what the automated systems usually do is they scan for keywords and then they also scan for titles. But if you can hit them with the keywords, um, you might be able to get through. Uh, so what I ended up doing on my own resume, because it was like, you know, I've been, been consulting, did interns, did like a lot of stuff recently. Um, I ended up taking out like the highlights of things I was most proud of, depending on what I was using the resume for. And I don't use it for, I was using like the last time I sent it was Harvard. So like, um, I pulled out like the stuff, the highlights and the skills that I knew they were going to be looking for. And I put that right at the top. And then I had my, um, experience underneath it for the different jobs with like a little summary, but I took out all the accomplishments and I put it there so that if you were looking at it and I've seen people even highlight some of the skills where they're like product strategy, and then you could be like lead product strategy at blah, 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 which was a growth stage company to do this and this. And I executed revenue growth from that wide of blah you know, with our strategy and this is what came out. So I honestly would just like hit him over the head with those types of things um, and just pull it out. And don't worry about the linear resume. I hate linear resumes. I'd actually, I just want to see like a digest of all the skills that I know you have and I don't have to go sift through it in like 18 different things and then pull it back out. Yeah, I totally get it. It's just these automated systems absolutely hate it when you take yeah. anything out of order, they just fall apart. Yeah. So I, I think like, the other part too is maybe like going through um, somebody who as a referral in some of those companies too. I've seen those work better as well. So if you can like maybe, so a lot of more junior people at organizations too were willing to have like a coffee with somebody who's like looking at coming to work there because they don't get like 18,000 meetings on their calendar. So like, oh, okay. And maybe if you can get their, your resume to them, they can like bump it up to the leader and get rid of the automated system. And by junior, I don't mean like super junior, but like, you know, more of like a VP or a director or something instead of like a chief executive officer. So, and that might be another way around it. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's like a lot with the automated systems. It's a lot about like trying to figure out how to get around it. Another thing you could do is attracting talent. I tell everybody to do this too. Um, 
LinkedIn is a great place that allows us all to basically blog now. Start writing about what you know and how all those experiences came together to put you where you are and people will follow you. And then you can use that to show people, right? They might be like, oh, I'm looking for somebody who could do this type of stuff and like connect with you on that. So most people who are hiring are on LinkedIn all day. If you find them, maybe just like connect with, connect with them, let them follow and then write about these things so that you get in front of them and they look at you and they go, oh, okay, this might be a good fit. All right, Micah, thanks for your question. And you may remember, I mean, we go back to 2005. We worked on that Sony thing together back. Remember with yep. those guys? Yes. That yes, was yes. fun. That was cool. Awesome, man. Your, your, and your definition build, of fun and mine are a little different, I think, but okay. Uh, yeah, it was fun at the startup, at the startup yeah. side. I mean, yeah, gotcha. Cool. Um, and I would just add less, so necessary for product. Well, actually, you know, I take that back. I, you know, when I help some of my clients with recruiting PMs, it's interesting to build on Melissa's point about anybody can have an online presence nowadays, right? It's so easy. It's never been easier to have some online presence to share your product thinking. And, you know, we, we were like a, a hot VC back startup and we would have, you know, plenty of applicants for these jobs and people would come in. And honestly, one of the things that would set apart people from the others is I would Google their name and some of them would have a website and it's like, okay, you're telling me you want a job as a web product manager, but you don't even have a web presence, you know, yeah. it's like, and then it's like, and all it took, it wasn't like an amazing website. I mean, it was actually for an associate product manager job or a PM job, some junior level job. And this person had just, she had created a website. She had just talked about her product philosophy. She put up a couple examples and some people are always like, oh, I can't put up examples because they're confidential. He totally redacted it. She yeah, totally redacted. like she redacted it. Right. And then it was like, it's like, here's my process or you can be like, Hey, let me do a redesign of Airbnb or let me do a teardown of this. Let me do a review of this. There, there are ways to put your, your knowledge out there that then add to your resume that hopefully somebody could see to see that you've got depth as a product person and get a sense for your product sense. So I would just, yes. And what Melissa said about putting content out there to share your thinking. Yeah. Yeah. And LinkedIn yeah. makes it so easy. And also like, it's much faster to get followers on LinkedIn than it is on Twitter these days. So like, I would just really keep it there. And that's like where everybody's going to read about things. So yeah, it's so easy to just write a post. It doesn't have to be crazy. Yeah. Quick check. Are, are you doing the Mastodon thing? Did you jump over there now or no? Or I signed up, but I didn't post anything because I keep forgetting yeah. to log in. Yeah, I'm I'm in the same boat. It was like mostly yeah, just LinkedIn so we'll now. See. Yeah. I'm still on Twitter, but yeah. like I, I post a lot on I try to post more on LinkedIn now. So I'm yeah, know, getting better. Me too. That. Speaking of UX, the whole Mastodon having multiple servers thing does not yeah. help them from a UX standpoint. So yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. We have two more questions left and then we'll wrap it up here. So next up we have Carol Greenbaum. Thanks for, for the talk. Um wanted to ask um a lot of the questions have been touching more on hard skills. How do you coach and mentor um PMs on the softer skills like politics, et cetera? Good question. Okay. So there is a great book about hiring product managers uh, by Kate Leto that you should look at because it does talk a lot about all these uh, soft skills and how we assess for them and figure out where they go. Um, one, I think teaching people how to present and how to communicate is really important. Um, two, explaining to them the different pieces of the organization and why certain people act <laughs> certain ways and, you know, how is sales compensated? How, what does marketing care about all these things? I think building empathy for people across it really helps with those things as well. Um, so that, that's a big piece, clear communication. So mm -hmm. presentation, but then also clear communication. Like when you're talking to somebody, how do you get to the point? How do you show them what the message is? How do you ask questions? Encouraging them to be like humble and curious and approach things from that, I think is important. Um, but also how to be visible in the organization, how to like go out, show your work, how to do those communications and when, like when do you want to present? When should you get into this? Because I do see some people get really eager and they try to like bust into the CEO or like be like, I need to talk to you about this right now. And it's like, that's not the appropriate venue for that. So I think those types of things are really important to remember. Um, when you're developing that, uh, I think politics is a lot about like, it's about building bridges, right? It, it, there's alignment. You can align things without building bridges. Like you can align, but that's like forcing people in a room to get together and say like, Hey, how are we going to do this? But then there's like building the bridge, which means there's open communication about challenges and how we get through things. So, um, so that's, that's important as well. Um, 
So I would really try to like, I, I would really try to focus on like helping them build empathy for other people in the organization. Mm-hmm. Um, and then helping them clearly communicate their intent. And that those are the two places I would really focus. Perfect. Thank you. All right, great. Cool. So I miscounted. We have two more people left real quick. So Marco Cupo. Well, in my case, my question is related to what we do with the project managers that maybe we <laughs> need to work with because the company in the past wasn't doing real product management. No, So I yeah. face this <laughs> very often because I start products from scratch but they already have project managers in place, no? And happens, this thing that you mentioned in the book, they think in the when and not in the why. What we can do? We need to send them to your course. We need to find another position. And sometimes I also also find hard situations and maybe fire uh, them because they don't adapt, no? It's it's tough. So their their project manager is not doing the role of the product manager, right? Exactly. Yeah. There's a lot of organizations that have tried to take project managers and turn them into product managers. You can train them. Some of them are actually good at being product managers. They get it. They're like willing to work there. So I would start with training. And if they, but what I would do, and this is what I've had to do before too, because I've been in the same situation as you, yes. build a build a rubric, like a like here's the skills a product manager needs, like lay that out, like a nice little career ladder, right? Talk to them before they go into training and be like, here's the gaps you're missing. We're going to send you to training. We're going to really help you with this. Um, but you have to be able to perform on these types of things within the next, you know, however months, year, whatever you want to do to do that. Give them a chance to do that. Give them a chance to like level up, give them the support, give them whatever they need to get there. They haven't gotten there. Now you can go back and be like, you don't, you didn't hone these skill sets, right? Like you, you're either not trying. Some of them just don't try. Some of them just self-select out of product management once they figure <laughs> it out. Like we we try to take like uh, 350 people at Athena Health and help them be product managers. And we train them all. We give them a chance to be. A lot of them came back and were like, I don't want to do this. Yes, <laughs> it's very tough. Yeah, compared to project really management. You know? and... Yeah, so like some of them just opted out. They were like, no, nah, I'm like, I'm a product ops person. I like that stuff, right? Or I'm going over here. So a lot of them just opted out, which is totally cool. I'd rather somebody do that than try to like struggle. So so give them the choice. Be like, if you don't think this role is fine for you, we can put you somewhere else in the organization if you have a right, good spot for them or they can choose to leave, right? So I would I would give them that the option, but like have that conversation and make it very skills-based and say like, we're gonna help you get the training, but you do have to demonstrate this level of competency for you to be in the product management role. And I will help you along the way. But if you can't get there, then we're going to have to talk about other options for you. So do you want to try? Do you want to move somewhere else right now? Like, what what do you want to do? And I think that's the best way to approach those those situations. Thanks a lot, Melissa. Cool. Great. Thanks for your question, Marlo. Okay, we're on the last question. I know it's getting a little late here. We have Raul Flamenco. Thank you for sharing. Uh, My question is more as a founder. As as I work in terms of other products, uh, what would be the probably not... You mentioned a VP, somebody with possibly sales emphasis. And I, I like that because I'm, I'm, I'm coming from sales. Mm-hmm. But what would be the skills that you look for in a in an early stage uh, PM? That that's like sales related? Or well, I'm 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 from sales, but I okay. want to if I were to hire somebody better than got me in, in product management. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Um okay, so are you the founder or are you I'm a founder? Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, so um, one, you have to decide, do I need, uh, do I need somebody who's going to help me shape the vision of the product from a perspective of like higher level stuff, or do I need somebody to execute? And I think you have to make that extremely clear. So if you're looking to bring on somebody to help you shape the vision, build a team around it, do all those things, you're looking for more of a director of product or above, like a head of product. And then in that situation too, you have to be willing as well to like give up some of that control over the product to them, right? Which can work well. That doesn't mean that you are not allowed in the product. It's still your baby. That's your thing. But like you collaborate with them to make sure that they get things done. The right person, you're going to have good conversations with them. You're going to be like, this is what I'm thinking. And they're going to they're gonna gel with you. You're going to synthesize. They're not going to argue with you about like high level vision of the company. They need to be on board with the vision of your company. And that's where I see sometimes friction between founders and heads of product come in but they might have suggestions on how they get to that vision with different types of things with software. And you want to, you want to feel good with that. And you want to feel like there's a good open dialogue where they together you're smarter, right. About where the company is going. So 
that's something to consider. So do you want a header product um, depending on how big you are or do you need somebody to execute? Now, if you need somebody to execute, um, how much direction are you giving them? Do you need somebody more senior because you want to be able to say like, hey, there's some problems over here. We have to solve, go figure it out. You're going to need a little more of a senior PM to be able to go mm -hmm. into the problems, figure out the problems, you know, identify what the right customers are, do the experimentation, lead the team. If you hire somebody super junior into that position with nobody over them, a lot of times they won't know where to go and they're just going to be flailing. They might just feel like really overwhelmed because you've got like a big gap between yourself and, and somebody super junior. So you're going to need somebody who's at least like a mid-level senior, like I'd say a senior individual product manager. Um, if you're looking for somebody to get, just get in there and get things done and make sense out of that situation. Um, and I would look for, you know, somebody who's got good experience as a product manager at a couple of places before I would say not, not like the only person at a startup that has learned from somebody who was a leader at a startup. Let's put it that way. Cause that means they had the frameworks, they learned well, and now they kind of want to tackle it on their own a little bit. They're a little bit of a go-getter. They want to go out there. They understand that they're going to be kind of on their own first product manager. And they're excited about that. Um, and that's the type of person that you really want to look for. But if you find somebody who's been a solo product manager at a different startup, and then they came to your startup, they might not have the frameworks in place to be super effective. And I find that like a lot of our MBA students want to graduate and go be the only product manager at a startup because they go, oh, I want equity. I'm like, well, first of all, like a lot of times you're not going to get a bunch of equity, like even as a first product manager. But second of all, who are you going to learn from if you've never done this before? Who are you, who's going to teach you the frameworks? Like you only learn so much in school. Who's going to coach you? And that's what makes it hard to be the first product manager when you're junior. If you've done this a couple of times and you're like, I've got a framework, you can come in and execute pretty easily. But if you mm -hmm. haven't done it a couple of times, it's usually a little harder. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Good luck. Thanks. All right, Raul, thank you for your question. I appreciate it. Thank you, Melissa, for taking the time to answer all these questions. So yeah. we hit most of the questions people had. And so I really appreciate you. I know it's getting late on the East Coast. Thank you very much for taking time to speak with our group today. Yeah, thanks everybody for having me.